Good morning, friends. It's Pastor Kyle. Welcome to worship. I'm so grateful that you're here as we continue our Make Waves Summer Sermon Series. Let's begin by singing together. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. Summer. And for many of us, that means being in the water. We take trips to the lake, maybe the ocean, and for sure the neighborhood swimming pool. Have you ever cannonballed into the pool? Whoa! When your body hits that matte water, you make an explosive splash and everyone around you gets soaked. In fact, the impact sends ripples in every direction until they fill the whole pool. When you make those waves, you change things. You see, every action has an opposite and equal reaction. And this summer, we're taking that idea even further because every time a follower of Jesus, that's us, takes an action to show who God is, we set off a wave of actions that changes the world around us. Now, each month here in Grace Kids, we discover something about God's character and how we can reflect that character because we're made in God's image. You could call these character traits or virtues, but we call them life apps, something that God is doing in you to change the world around you. When we demonstrate these ideas, we show the world what God is like. And this summer, we're looking at how several of these life apps show up specifically in what the Apostle, Apostle Paul called the fruit of the Spirit. He wrote about them in Galatians 5, and that is our memory verse for this month. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
And this summer we are looking at how several of these, with the help of God's Spirit, can have us make waves everywhere we go. And I'm not talking about the swimming pool. Instead of a wild jump, you can change your attitude by how you react when times get tough. You can make waves when you invite the kid that everybody thinks is different to your birthday party. And when you choose to cheer for your teammates even when you're sitting on the sideline with a sprained ankle. You can make waves when you help two friends that are arguing remember what they love about each other. And when you take a deep breath and smile even when your little brother asks you to play the happy train game for the 24th time. It's not always easy to choose love, joy, and patience, but with the power of God's Spirit, you can dive in and make waves. God's love inside of you can change the world around you and others will see God at work in you. That's why making waves is an amazing way to worship God with your life. Because worship is more than just singing loud, it's about living loud. But here's the best news. We're not only learning how to make waves around us each Sunday morning, that is the theme of our Vacation Bible School. And I am so excited to be back together in person. Registration is happening now and we need you to sign up so we can reserve your spot. Go to the link on our website, our Facebook page, our Grace Notes, or just contact me and I'll save your spot. You know, Jesus once said to his friends, here is my command, love one another just as I have loved you. That's something you and I can do every day. We can make waves by sharing the love that Jesus shares with us. I can't wait to see how this plays out in you and in me this summer. Be sure to register for VBS and I'll see you next week.
Friends, as we gather and worship this day, we know that there is much that is going right and good and beautiful in the world. And we know there is much that is broken and hurting. We continue to think about all those affected by violence here in our community uh, and around the nation and around the world. We continue to pray for the people of Ukraine. Uh, we recognize that there are refugees, not only from Ukraine, but from all sorts of places that are looking for a, a, a safe home, at least for a while. And we know that in our own lives, there are various uh, things for which we give thanks and through which we struggle. And we trust that God meets us in the midst of that and hears us as we pray. So would you join me as we go together to God in prayer? God of power and God of presence, come and meet us this day as we gather with one another. Fill us with your presence in the season of Pentecost as we celebrate the promise that your spirit is with us now in all the days of our lives. Meet us with grace and forgiveness this day, for we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We've been sidetracked from what really matters. We've become too committed to our own agendas. We fail to prioritize our time with you and don't make space for you to move in our lives and move us from the places of our stubborn encampment. Lord, in your mercy, make us new. For the times and the places where we fail to love our neighbors with our whole hearts, to look after the sick and hurting and the vulnerable, to care for the widow and the orphan and the foreigner and the refugee, Forgive us for our hearts that have become anesthetized to violence in our own country. Awaken us. May we know our power and our calling to work for peace in this place and in all places in the world and for all of your children this day and always. When we are wondering and waiting and wandering, God, would you meet us with your streams of living water? When we are tired and weary and running thin on patience and feeling like we have little capacity left, meet us with your life-sustaining presence. When we are wandering in the desert, may we come to find that you meet our needs. And when we see others struggling, may we provide strength to them. In this season of, of summer, let us take the invitation to rest. May we recover, allowing ourselves to be fulfilled by your spirit and take delight in your creation. May we restore ourselves with that which gives us energy and joy so that we'll be sustained for the seasons of head and, and ahead. And may we practice Sabbath breaks, care for ourselves and others so that we know how to live fully in every season of life. God, in this time of worship, may our attention and focus be on you. May our hearts be changed and may our lives be transformed so that we may more closely reflect your desires for us and that we may more closely reflect the love of Christ to all that we meet and all that we do. We pray and ask this in your name and the power of your Holy Spirit as we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that
Good morning, friends. As we continue this series, Make Waves, looking at uh, uh, not only how it is that we can make an impact in the world, but also how water gets used throughout the scriptures. Uh, I'm excited for this message from uh, Exodus 17. If you want to follow along, we'll begin in verse 1. We also have a reading from Matthew 11, a familiar text that I find myself drawn to every summer. Um, you heard it from me last year, and I think it's a good uh, informative text for us where we're at. But let's begin with Exodus 17. From the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephraim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and they said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel at me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and said, why did you bring us here out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, what shall I say to these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Manasseh and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? And then our gospel reading is from Matthew's 11th chapter. Hear these words of Jesus as he speaks to the crowd. Come to me then all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May God add blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. So I guess it is summer after all, uh, not only because we passed Memorial Day, but because this week we had some heat. I don't know if you noticed, um, but, but somebody asked me, I, I believe it was Monday or Tuesday, they said, how are you enjoying the heat? And, and really I could best sum that up with a, a picture of my dog. Uh, this is how Gunner was enjoying the heat and that's pretty much how I was feeling. So I found myself getting ready to complain. I was driving around. I was looking at the thermometer on my car. It said 80 degrees. And then I was looking at the ones on uh, buildings and whatnot. I said, it cannot possibly be 80 degrees. It is far too hot. I, I'm sweaty. I'm uncomfortable. I began to complain, but then I caught myself. After all the rain that we've had, after the, the soggy month of May, after all of those overcast days, maybe I should just be grateful. Maybe I shouldn't complain about this. This week, I also went to annual conference. That's something that we pastors uh, get together once a year, or at least before the pandemic. And, and now we get together once a year. I had to drive up to Nebraska, up to Omaha. Well, not even Omaha, actually a, a suburb of Omaha. And um, um, I had to be away from my dog and my wife. And uh, uh, I'm on call because we don't know when the baby will come. And that's a little bit anxious. It's a, a long long drive. It's a long day of meetings, several days of meetings and sitting and waiting and it's, there's some conflict. And so I found myself as I was getting ready to go, starting to complain, but it was, uh, um, it was a little reminder for me about how perhaps that isn't helpful. Saying what I need to do and what I'm anxious about leaving is fine but complaining about it wasn't really getting me anything. And, and I realized something in the midst of that, that, that uh, over the last two years, we haven't been able to meet. 
And a lot of the people that were there are some of my close friends that I haven't seen in years. And we've, we've been apart because of the pandemic. We haven't been able to gather. And so I got to see and to reconnect with people. I got to be in a place. I got to have a, a nice drive, actually a pleasant drive. I got to have a party from a program that I'm graduating from, except I actually finished it a year and a half ago, but we haven't been able to celebrate it all together. So it wasn't all that bad. We pastors like to hem and haw about it, but the complaint doesn't really get us anywhere. So I was thinking about a couple weeks back, Hope and I were trying to find some time to get together with some friends and we had a small group on Monday nights and then there was a meeting on Tuesdays and then uh, some, people, some of the people had stuff with other friends on Wednesday and Thursday night was a family thing and Friday was an event and Saturday there was a concert and, and it was like trying to get this together was so ridiculous and, and, and the next week looked all the same and I found myself starting to complain and getting frustrated and saying, why is it so hard for us to find time to get together? There were so many events and activities and work functions and family get-togethers and sports and concerts. But then I caught myself. I had to remind myself that it wasn't that long ago where our schedules were filled with a whole lot of nothing. No travel, events, shows, concerts, scarcely a family gathering, almost never with friends. Zoom was the way that you hung out or it was weather dependent because you had to meet outside. People were sick. We were afraid. Vaccines were still far off on the horizon. I would have been so grateful to have a calendar filled with anything but the four walls of our house at that time. So what was complaint getting me? And friends, isn't that how it is for us? I mean, not just for us now, but all times, uh, two years ago and, and maybe throughout our lives, we live in a time and a place that has a currency of complaints. We too often begin an update to a friend uh, with what's wrong or broken. Uh, even when there's nothing really wrong or broken, we sort of start that way. We can find something, the weather, work, schedules. Uh, we didn't prioritize sleep enough. We overcommit ourselves. We have too many friends to possibly stay in contact with all of them. Woe be unto us. We complain a lot. We uh, often, I, I think of this currency as something we trade, like, like the, the conversation has to begin with like three complaints from me and three complaints from you. And then by the way, it should also end that way. We trade them like kids trade baseball cards. We lead with complaints, we end with them. And we, we sort of over complain, like you've got to complain, I can, I can out complain you. It's not something that I love about our culture, but it's also not something that is unique to our time and our place. If you read through the first 17 chapters of Exodus leading up to our reading today, you'll notice that the Israelites complain and complain and complain over and over and over again. Now, let's recap their story. When, when we pick up um, uh, with the Exodus story, the Israelites before the Exodus are, are slaves in Egypt. And so they're required to work for taskmasters over and over and over again. And, and the working conditions are getting worked. They have to, worse, they have to produce more, uh, more bricks with less resources. They have to work more days. They work long, excruciating days. And no, no matter how much they give, no matter how much they do, no matter how much they produce, it's never going to be enough. They don't have control over themselves. Again, they're slaves. And, and so they're this oppressed people who, for whom things are really not going that well. And then by no work of their own, God comes and miraculously intervenes and delivers them out of slavery. God shows up, speaks through Moses, who speaks to the Pharaoh. There are these miraculous interventions of the plagues. Uh, and then they're finally uh, delivered out of Egypt. But not only are they delivered out of Egypt, the Egyptians give them all their gold. They walk out loaded and they say, get out of here, leave our country. So this was an enslaved people who had no rights, no power, no anything. And then they're leaving with all the gold, with the people saying, go and get out of here. And then Pharaoh changes his mind and chases after them. So they begin uh, to, to be backed up against the sea, more or less. And God parts the sea and they walk through on dry land. God is moving in all sorts of miraculous ways in the midst of this. That's their story. That's the preface to the Exodus narrative. And so you can understand why it feels ridiculous that after they've been freed from their oppressors, that they immediately start complaining. No sooner have they been freed from their bondage than they find things to complain about. The desert was hot. The food wasn't good. The water tasted weird. Uh, there wasn't meat or, or there wasn't enough meat. Uh, Moses was cryptic and noncommittal. Um, I, as if he'd never led a people out of slavery before. Of course he hadn't. It was a new journey, a new land for all of them. There was much learning to be done. And then we get to today. The people say, we're thirsty. Why did you bring us out here? Did you just want to kill us all in our livestock? What was the point of all of this? 
the people are quarreling, which sort of means prosecuting or testing Moses and God. And Moses says to God, they're going to stone me. But the first 17 chapters of Exodus are filled with complaint after complaint after complaint. The Back to Egypt committee is in full swing. So when we read their story, it's easy to think how ridiculous. You've seen these miraculous interventions. By no work of your own, you've been delivered up out of slavery. How can you possibly be complaining already when God has done so much? But I'm sure that they would read about our stories and our complaints and say, how petty. You have permanent housing. You've never been enslaved. You have running water. You have a grocery store that usually has everything you need, although there's a distinct lack of quail generally available. You have all the knowledge you want, you could possibly need, literally all the knowledge of the whole world in your pocket, and you use it to watch cat videos? What are you complaining about, right? They would look at our story and say, it's equally as ridiculous. So I don't want to cast dispersions on them. I don't want to throw stones. I just want us to recognize that this is a part of the human condition. It's a part of our culture. We're just emerging out of a a pandemic that put the whole world on pause for months. And yet we're still finding things to complain about. Now, if I were God, I would have grown tired of us and tired of the Israelite people by now. And really a long time ago, I would have put cotton balls in my ears and said, fine, you whiners. Be like Burger King, have it your own way. You're all on your own. Take care of it. I don't want anything to do with it. One of the pieces of good news this morning, friends, is that I'm I'm not God. That's always good news, by the way. And God doesn't seem nearly as petty and impatient and frustrated as I tend to be. Instead, what happens? God meets the Israelite people with, with nourishment in the wilderness. God fulfills their wants and their needs, addresses their concern. And not only does God give them sustenance, enough to sort of get by, but there is bountiful blessing. The water keeps flowing so that all the people get what they want and all the livestock get what they want. It's this bountiful overflow. And so there is this uh, another intervention of miraculous proportions right there in the wilderness, in the desert, from a rock comes the streams of living water. And friends, isn't that just like God? To give us rivers in our wasteland, to give us blessing for our curses. God gives us God's best for our worst. Joy when we're complaining, strength when we're weary, Even life in the midst of death, isn't that just like God? So I want to pause for just a minute and feel free to pause this video and ask you, where is that taking place in your life? Where is that taking shape right now? That that God is giving you blessings in the midst of the wilderness, that God is giving you sustenance or bountiful blessings in the midst of a place that is difficult. What, What shape, what form is that taking in your life right now? How are you experiencing goodness and grace, maybe even in a challenging season. Every year, friends, when summer rolls around, I think about the invitation that it provides, that this season provides, to slow down, to enjoy the long days that that seem to pass so quickly, the, the invitation for rest and recovery and restoration and practice, the invitation to pause and be present and to give praise, the invitation uh, that this season offers to me often parallels what what I frequently hear the Spirit saying to me uh, about taking time to slow down, to enjoy creation and the blessings of God, to pause and reflect, to drink the water when I'm parched that's so often around me, even if I don't know it to be aware that I'm not wandering alone, that indeed God is with us, to be reminded that the Lord is among us even when it feels differently. I hear that over and over. I experience that in the summer, this invitation to slow down. But if I slow down any time of the year to pray, I hear God's Spirit inviting me into that over and over and over. So for you this summer specifically, what does that invitation look like? We're right here at the beginning of the summer. Maybe you want to set some intention for the days and the weeks and the months that come ahead. How are you going to take time to enjoy God's blessings? How is it that you're going to rest and recharge and refuel uh, and build yourself up, not only so that you don't feel depleted, but so that you have a reservoir to tap into when seasons get busy again, when life changes? How are you going to intentionally carve out space to reflect and to pause? How will you respond to summer's invitation this year? I want us to notice 
in the scriptures uh, today a, a few things for us to reflect on. First of all, do you notice that Moses uses his staff? That's what God says. Take the staff that you have, this staff that you carried with you when you went and talked to Pharaoh. This staff that before that was a sign uh, of the miraculous power of God when you were in the wilderness. This staff that you used to, to change water into blood. This staff that you have used to guide you on the way. Take this staff, this thing that you have, a stick, okay? Let's call it what it is, and use that. I think that's important for us to remember because sometimes God is calling us to use what we have. Sometimes we think like, if I had something else, then this problem would be solved. If I had X, then I would help address the needs of the community. If I had more money, if I had more resources, if I had more time, if I had more of this or that or something different, then I would be able to use that to make a difference in the community that is around me. But God calls Moses to use exactly what he has. Maybe God is calling you to do the same thing. What is it that you have to address situations of struggle in your life or in other people's life that can make a difference right now. God tells him to use what he has in order to experience blessing. The second thing for us to notice, the blessing doesn't come by way of getting out of the wilderness. You see, sometimes we get into a season of difficulty and struggle, and what we really want is a ticket to a different destination. Uh, we get in a conflict with somebody, and what we really want is just to avoid them and not have to see them for weeks to come so that everything can just simmer down or, or boil under the surface. We want to portal into somebody else's circumstances. We want the gift of somebody else's reality, maybe a curated reality at that. We just want an escape from the season that we're at. Sometimes we want to go somewhere else when we find ourselves in the wilderness, in the desert, in the difficult place but oftentimes that's not how it works. Maybe it is, but maybe instead we'll get the blessing right in the midst of that. Uh, no, you can't be rid of this wilderness, but here's a refreshing drink for you in the midst of it. Uh, no, you can't be rid of this desert, but here's a reminder that God is with you. No, you can't fast forward through the difficulty. No, there may not be a cure or clarity, but here's some comfort for the space that you find yourself in right now. God isn't always going to let us escape from the difficulty. In fact, sometimes being faithful is going to lead us directly into the desert and the difficulty as it has for the Israelite people. But the promise is that God is there with us and that God will sustain us in the midst of that. Maybe we need to be reminded of that, that it's not about going to somewhere else. It's not about everything being solved, but about the promise that God is here with us and providing us sustenance and life even in the midst of the struggle. Something else I think we can notice is that sometimes these blessings will come in the most unexpected situations. Many people who have wandered through the wilderness or through a dark night of the soul will say that in that time they gleaned uh, things from that journey that they never would have gleaned otherwise. It doesn't mean that we want that difficulty or that challenge or that loss or that grief. It just means that they experience the presence of God differently and, and perhaps carry things with them, reminders of that season in ways that they never would have been able to experience if they stayed comfortable and safe. Uh, so, so where does that happen for you, that, that you've received a, a blessing from a time of struggle that, that you've carried with you through a season, other seasons of life? By the way, even there in the wilderness, it's in the most unlikely of places that the blessing emerges, right? We don't expect to be blessed in the wilderness, but it's the, the most unlikely uh, of places. I love this part. Alan Story talks about this. How, how crazy do you have to be if you're Moses to take your staff and go and like, tap a rock twice. Okay, even for all the miraculous things that the Israelite people have seen that Moses has been a part of, I feel like it takes a lot to be like, water? And what did the, the, the Israelite elders that were with him, it says that he brings the elders with him, Moses does. What did they have to be thinking like, we're getting water where you're walking towards a giant rock? What's this going to look like? How much faith does it take to step into that, to rock, walk up and hit it. And so uh, let me say the obvious, rocks don't have water in them. And yet it's not only in the wilderness, not only in the desert, but in a rock that the streams of living water come from. It is the most unlikely of places. So could it be that for you and for me, the most challenging person, the most conflicted relationship, the, the, perhaps even the most hard-hearted person that we know relationship that we're in could be the one to bless us, to fill us up, to sustain us, 
to give us strength for the journey? Of course it could be the most challenging person, relationship, place, situation that might be the, the, the play, the, what holds our blessing because that's the way that God works. And it may come in some very unexpected way. It could be, look like something that, that, that shouldn't sustain us at all. That, in a nutshell, is what Jesus is. Jesus isn't what they were looking for. Because since the time of Moses, who who brought the people up out of slavery, who liberated them, and throughout the Israelite history, they were conquering and they were conquered. They were powerful and then powerless. They were victors and then they were subjugated. But the belief was that the Messiah would be the one to come to, to make them the military powerhouse, to put them at the top of the pecking order so that they would no longer be occupied by a Roman empire and controlled by an outside force and continuing to work in one way or another for the wealth and the well-being of other people besides themselves. That was the belief that that was the empire that was coming, that that was, uh, that, that was the Messiah that was coming to set them free from the empire once and for all, to put them in charge. In the Israelite version of if I were God, that's what they imagined the Messiah would do, would set them free, and they got Jesus. And I don't know how closely you've read the Jesus story, but, but that wasn't what he did. They were hoping for a mix of like a Arnold Schwarzenegger and George Washington. And they got Jesus. And he didn't immediately set everything aright. He didn't lead them to freedom. He didn't crush the Roman occupiers. He didn't restore the kingdom of Israel. He preached and he taught and he grieved. He lived life. He proclaimed abundant life. He invited them into God's true life. But he didn't do all of the things that they thought and imagined and perhaps even hoped he would. And still we call him the true source of the living water. Not the one who fixes everything, but the one who loves us through it. He's the redeemer, not the one who solves all that's broken and puts it back together in ways that we can understand, but the one who provides us the strength that we need to journey in the midst of it. God does this all of the time. In the midst of our wilderness and our struggle and our whining and our our weariness, God shows up to provide rivers in our wasteland. We see it in the story of the Israelite people. We see it in the life of Jesus. We hear that call today in our lives to be refreshed and restored, not when things get better and everything gets put back together, but right here and right now. When we give complaints or feel like we have nothing at all to give, God gives blessings and possibility and hope. So every time I read this scripture from Matthew, I feel like I need to to, to reflect, uh, to share the message version of it by Eugene Peterson. I did this last summer. I'll do it again. I think it's powerful and I think it's important. And I'll read this and then just ask you a few questions as we move into a time of reflection. Are you Tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me. You'll recover real life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So friends, what are the rivers in your wasteland? that invitation from Jesus to find rest in him, what form is that taking in your life right now? Where have you encountered them before? And what shape do they have here and now? How is it that God is sustaining you in every season of life? Let's take a few moments for reflection.
As we continue in worship, I want to give you an opportunity to give of your gifts, tithes, and offerings. Uh, we are so grateful for all that God entrusts to us, and we know that a part of what we're called and invited to do is to give that back to the work of God in the world. So I would invite you to give out of a place of uh, gratitude, knowing that God takes what it is that we offer, sometimes uh, as meager as it can be, and turns it into something great and wonderful. What a blessing it is to know that we get to join with the work of God in the world in this way. I'd invite you also to join us in singing this last song together, one of my favorites. I searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. Turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Friends, my hope and my prayer is that as you move through this week or uh, any season of struggle that you find yourself in, that you find rivers of living water, things that will sustain you, reminders of God's presence in the miraculous or the mundane that help you move through whatever challenge and difficulty you face in life. May you be blessed this week. May you share God's love with all that you meet. And may the peace of Christ rule in your hearts this day and always. Go in grace and go in peace. Amen.